thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming today. And also thank you to Oxford University Press for making it possible for me to be here and talk to you this morning. Um, today I'll be talking about reading. And I think reading is really important. Um, I think it's so important that it should be part of every language program. And I think if your language program, if your language classes don't include reading, uh, maybe you should start. And I'm going to explain a few ways you can do that uh, at the end of today's talk. So my experience with reading, um, as a young child, I really loved books. I read a lot. I read two or three books a day in elementary school. Uh, you probably know some children like this. In high school, um, I experienced extensive reading in a foreign language. Of course, I didn't know what it was. I just realized the effect it had. So I read some books in French, and after that, my French became much better. And for the first time, I liked French. This was a huge experience for me, a really big change. And it kind of stuck with me. After I came to Sendai, I worked as an ALT. As you know, ALTs don't have a huge amount of leeway. They have to work closely with the Japanese homeroom teachers or English teachers. And um, I wasn't able to start doing extensive reading until a bit later. Uh, I started teaching part-time at university. And it was Miyagi Kyokura, actually. I had a part-time class, a four-skills English class, and I was able to start doing extensive reading with the students there. Just a tiny little bit. Because, of course, I had to carry the books. I was a part-time teacher, I didn't have an office. So every week, I'd take a bus with my you know, two bags of books. It was pretty tough. But it was really nice to see the students' reactions. When I started working at Tohoku University, um, I was able to start doing extensive reading there as well. And now, six years later, we have quite a big extensive reading program. We have about 15,000 books. Uh, we have about 10 teachers doing extensive reading, maybe about 2,000 students a year doing the extensive reading program. And that's been a huge success, uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that as well. Finally, um, I help out at a language school called Cambridge English, where we teach young children uh, as well as older children, high school students, a few adults, and we really started putting a lot of effort into extensive reading. From April, we'll be starting a new extensive reading program. Lots of preparation, lots of planning. Um, so, if anyone has questions, um, during the talk, I'd like to ask you if you have a really short question. So if I can answer in about 20 seconds, please stick your hand up any time, ask a question. If you have a longer question, please wait until the end. We'll take a little bit of time for questions. And of course, during lunch, if you have a, a personal question or something that's about your situation, uh, please come and talk to me after the presentation finishes. Okay, so reading, the power of reading is huge, I think. Research shows that readers, uh, people who read fiction, tend to be more emotionally stable, more connected. Okay, readers um, <clears throat> tend to have more imagination. Right, they have more general knowledge. In terms of language acquisition, reading is one of the best ways to get language. To get words, to get grammar, to get genre, to understand language. <clears throat> it's the only way, pretty much, to get academic language, or literary language, or specialised language, because we don't use this when we speak. It's only used written down. So for students to go beyond the conversational language, they pretty much have to read. For school, reading is the super skill. If you're a good reader, most subjects will be easy for you. If you're a bad reader, most subjects will be difficult. Readers tend to write better. In fact, one of the few ways you can improve your writing skills is through reading. Through reading, you get a sense of the language, how written language is put together. How do you get better at Kokomo, Japanese? Do you study kanji and, and memorize grammar? Not really. Generally, the best students at Kokomo are the ones that read. 
and it's the same for English. English is not different from Japanese. So the best students at English are going to be the ones with the most input. <clears throat> now, of course, listening input is fantastic as well, but it's much more difficult to get, especially in Japan. Reading input is much easier to get. And a reading program is much easier to administer because books can easily be put into levels and you can run a program that way. With listening, it's much more difficult to say what level listening is. Right? Because it's not just the language, it's the speed, it's the accent, it's all sorts of variables that make it very difficult. And um, extensive listening is nowhere near as developed as extensive reading is. So for teachers, reading is much easier to do. And finally, reading and life. Reading is such a wonderful experience. Right? If you're a reader, you can escape to different worlds, you can relax. Studies show that readers um, report less stress in their life as adults, so they find reading relaxing, and they can use it to um, step away from their busy lives. Also, reading is pretty much the best way to get new knowledge. So if you want to improve your skills, if you want to learn new things, reading is the way to do it, even now in the 21st century. Even though YouTube has videos about pretty much anything, we can learn things, but to get deep knowledge on a new topic, I really think you have to read, and preferably read books as well. So reading is a really important skill. Now, you might say, my students don't read in Japanese, so they're not going to read in English. Well, if you're an English teacher, that's not your problem. Your job is to encourage the students to read in English. And in fact, at Tohoku University, um, we find through talking to the students and getting student surveys, often their feedback is, I'm so glad I had this class. Normally, I'm too busy. I don't make time to read. But because of this class, because this was homework, I had to make time to read, and I really enjoyed it. So I think this is the key. Even if students don't make reading a priority, you can ask them to. And the ones that do it will get the benefit, even if it's not necessarily their choice. I'll talk a little bit about expectations later. So basically, I think reading is really close to a superpower. It's the only superpower we can give our students. Right? It's the power to succeed in school, to succeed in life, to succeed personally, to be happy, uh, and to succeed at work. So it's a real shame to waste the opportunity to give the students a superpower. Now, I think the world is really changing quite quickly at the moment. One way it's changing, even in Japan, or especially in Japan, is through globalization and internationalization. I'm going to use these differently. So for me, globalization is Japan reaching out to the world. So in the past, only the largest companies would trade internationally. Now, even a single craftsman in Japan craftswoman can have a website in English and sell what they do all over the world. So Japan really has the opportunity now to reach out. Students can go online and attend university courses at MIT at Stanford for free. So the best, the, the best educate one of the best educations in the world that would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars is free if you reach out and take it. So this globalization here is a, a huge opportunity for students. Internationalization is Japan changing from within. So Japan is becoming more international <clears throat> in many ways. I've certainly noticed over the last 10, 15 years the number of foreign students working in Japan has really increased in a visible way. So lots of shops, lots of convenience stores have foreign students working. Japan is becoming more international. Tourism. Last year was the biggest year of tourism in Japan. Um, 
the huge numbers of tourists coming to Japan. I think this is going to continue. The second huge change, and unlike globalization and internationalization, which are current topics in Japan, the government is talking about this, people are talking about this, schools are talking about this, nobody really is talking about mechanization and artificial intelligence. And this is a huge change that is coming. Maybe you've heard talk of uh, for example, robots in hospitals will deliver meals to sick rooms. Or Japan is trying to develop nursing robots to help with care of the elderly. This is just the tip of the iceberg. You've probably noticed in your daily life, gas stations, supermarkets, restaurants, are becoming more and more automatized. Instead of talking to people, we can do everything using a machine and a credit card. This is only going to accelerate. The next wave is probably automatic cars. So all driving jobs will be gone pretty soon. In America, they're testing computer systems that can diagnose patients. So even professionals like doctors or lawyers could find their jobs disappear, or at least reduce so, at this point, in 2015, we don't know what the jobs of the future will be. We don't know what jobs students will do. We don't know if they will do jobs. So, how can we prepare students for this future? And what is the role of education in the 21st century? For me, because we can't see the future, we need to give students general skills that will help them in doing lots of different things. And particularly focusing on the skills of interpersonal relationships and um, creativity and dealing with information. So the 21st century skills, I believe, <coughs> will be language skills, most of all. So Japanese, the first language, English as a second language, as it's pretty much the common language of the world now, and also other languages. I think it's a real shame that schools in Japan don't teach um, the neighboring languages, teach Chinese, teach Korean, um, because these are the relationships <coughs> students are going to have. I think it would be wonderful if elementary school students, junior high school students, could learn not just English, but also another language. Interpersonal skills will be extremely important. The ability to work with other people. Not just your peers, but people older than you, people younger than you, people with different ideas. So in a classroom, we'd hope to have lots of pair work, lots of group work, working with the teacher, working without the teacher, and working with other students in other classes. This can be done quite easily by making videos for each other that kind of collaboration. Even if they can't be in the same room at the same time, you can have uh, a dialogue between the students. Intercultural skills will become really important. As we saw, Japan is becoming more globalized and more international. <coughs> so intercultural skills will be important. So what's an intercultural skill? It's kind of a buzzword, isn't it? I think there's three aspects to this. The first one, is knowing about other cultures. And we can do this by meeting people, by going to other cultures, or by reading. Reading is a huge gateway to other cultures. Another aspect of intercultural skills is being comfortable with difference. So if something is different, you can accept it and try to learn about it. And the third part of intercultural skills is knowing your own culture and being comfortable with that. So I think students in Japan need to learn about other cultures. They need to learn that sometimes things are not fixed and they need to learn about Japanese culture as well. And that, I think, gives us a rounded intercultural skill. Curiosity is going to be extremely important. In the future, as jobs change, students will also need to change learn new things. And I think curiosity comes from 
freedom and independence. If students have a chance to study things they're interested in, to look at things and to ask questions, this is where curiosity grows. If students have no chance to do that, they will become less and less curious. And finally this, finding information, thinking about information, and then writing the information in a new way. Right? Maybe a summary, maybe recommendations. This is hugely important. Basically, reading, thinking, and writing. So even now, in the 21st century, I think we, we haven't moved on from reading and writing as the main uh, communication skills. And today I'll be talking about non-fiction content, because there are hundreds and thousands of wonderful stories for children, but not as much non-fiction. And I'd like to draw your attention to some reasons why non-fiction is useful and important, and also some resources as well. Oxford University Press has a huge number of non-fiction books, and it's a really impressive resource that you can tap into. So non-fiction is familiar for students. Right? So if it's a topic the students know about, this makes it much easier for them to learn the English about it. They already know the topic. It's familiar. Toyama Sensei was talking about cross-curricular activities. I think this is huge. Like, if we only teach English in English class, that's a waste. It's a waste of time, it's a waste of an opportunity. By teaching a range of different things, um, most of the non-fiction I deal with is uh, science, technology, nature, um, history. These topics, often they're things that the students know about, or they're things that the students will find useful in other places. So we can not just learn English, also content. And actually, learning content in English is a much better way of learning English because it's interesting. Stephen Krashen talks about um, input has to be really interesting. It has to be so interesting that you forget that it's in a foreign language. And by you doing non-fiction content, we can sometimes get students so excited about the information they forget it's in English. Non-fiction is easier to understand. For me, I'm not a good reader in Japanese. I haven't studied kanji enough. But I find non-fiction much easier to read than fiction. For a few reasons. Names. Non-fiction has fewer personal names. Um, setting. Setting is normally clear in non-fiction. And the topic. If you, if you choose the genre, be. So for me, reading about education in Japanese is very easy. Reading about politics, not so much. But as long as you, this is, again, Krashen talks about reading deeply. So he says it's really important for students to find something they like and then just read a lot of that one thing. They can build up their language skills, but it's also really easy to understand. So if you read one book about frogs, the next book about frogs will be easier to understand, and so on. After 20 books about frogs, you'll be a real expert, and you'll know all the language involved. And finally, non-fiction books are really attractive. The newest ones have beautiful photos, uh, charts, diagrams, they're really attractive. They draw the students in, regardless of the fact that they're in English. This is a survey we did at Tormac University, and we asked students, what kind of books do you like to read? And these are students that have finished, they've done one semester of extensive reading, <coughs> lots of experience reading books. And these are the results, these are percentages. We asked about uh, 2,000 years. So as you can see, half the students prefer fiction. They want to read fiction. And 13% prefer non-fiction. They want to read non-fiction. In my experience, mostly kind of engineers and science students. But there's this big group in the middle, and they like both. <coughs> so basically, if you only have fiction in your classes, you're only addressing half of the students. The other half would like to have non-fiction as well. So I think it's really important when you're choosing books or buying materials 
<laughs> please try to make sure that um, you have both, you have a balance of the materials. So I'm going to identify these five series um, that OUP publishes. Um, and they're more or less in order of complexity. I'm going to show you some pages from the series. I'm going to tell you how I use them and what I like about these. <coughs> Oxford uh, Fireflies is a section, it's a subsection of the Oxford Reading Tree. And it goes from level 1, which is very easy, up to level 10, which is pretty challenging. Um, Project X is a series that was developed in Britain, and it's designed to help boys read. Because in Britain, boys don't read as much as girls. And a lot of the reading material that was thought didn't really appeal to boys. So this Project X uh, series is designed to address that. It's got lots of science, it's got lots of uh, adventure, and it's supposed to help boys get into reading. And it has a lot of non-fiction. It's about 50-50, right? So half are stories, half are non-fiction kind of content. Dolphin Readers is a real favorite of mine. <coughs> They're wonderfully versatile books. You can use them as readers, you can use them as activity books, you can use them as a teacher-student interaction. When I show you the pages, I'll talk about how we use these in class. In Fact is a new series, and they're beautiful. You'll see the pictures in a minute. Um, and they start at level six on the ORT. So it's a little bit challenging. This isn't for beginner readers. This is for readers who have got going. Um, up to 11. And finally, Oxford Read and Discover is an, a graded reader series um, that is a little bit more advanced than the others. Uh, and this goes from level one to level six. But these levels and these levels, these are not ORT levels. Okay, the first, these three, Fireflies, Project X, and Reading Tree, this is using the same scale. And these two have a different scale. But it's fair. I'll show you the um, how to compare this. So fireflies, as you can see, this is the first level of fireflies. Very very simple. Look at this rhinoceros. It is big. And depending on the level of the students, you could focus on rhinoceros, or you could just focus on big. So even with the smallest beginning students, you can start using this kind of. Level 2 moves up a bit, a bit more complex language, so a cooker makes food hot, but again you've got the option to work with different levels of language here. You can even use the same book with different years in a different way. Um, very versatile, very attractive. This is Project X, so the series that's supposed to appeal to boys. And this is level 3. In there. So you can see, a little bit more complex, but still fairly easy. And also, you can use this to jump off into other activities. You can easily imagine, for example, asking students to make similar posters by themselves, using a different food, a different um, aspect. It's a very, very versatile. You can read it, the students can read it, um, you can use it to jump off into other classrooms. And these are dolphin readers. Now, this is the first level of dolphin readers, the starter level. And in dolphin readers, the left-hand page is a reading page, and the right-hand page is an activity. And the nice thing about these activities is that they're really classroom friendly. Dolphin readers has five levels, eight books in each, it's 40 books. And the classroom set is really reasonable. Uh, it's, I think it's just over 15,000 yen if you buy it today. And that's great. And basically what we use these books for in class is it's a filler. So when we have a little bit of time, we can pull out the dolphin reader. We can read with the students. We can go through the activities with the students as, as the teacher. Um, Another way you can use these is ask the students to buy the books. And then they can use them as workbooks. But there's a real wide range of content. You can have a look at the back later on. Um, this is level three. 
the same series. So it goes starter, one, two, three. And you can see the language is much more uh, advanced here. So to really fly like a bird, you need to use a hang glider. It's light like a kite and it has wings like a bird. These type of questions, I quite like doing these orally. So I'll fold it over and I won't let the students see them, I'll just ask the students for them. You can read the questions and have them answered. This is based on the content of the book. Again, really user friendly. Um, I find lots of books I find quite difficult to read, but this Dolphin series is really excellent the way the activities are structured. And this is the In Fact series. This particular book is talking about food chains. It's called Who Eats Who? And this is the lowest level of this series. You can see they're very attractive here. So this is the food chain in Cold Place. I can't remember if polar bears live in the Antarctic? Arctic? Arctic? So this is probably Arctic, isn't it? So shrimp eaten by Arctic cod, eaten by seals, eaten by polar bears. Again, you can just imagine how much you could jump off from this into students making their own students investigating on this topic. The final page of this book is wonderful. Um, I'll leave you to find out for yourself. This is the top level of In Fact. Much harder. I did this last week with a couple of students and they loved it. It's a really interesting topic. This book is the top 10 worst jobs ever. And these are all taken from history, from British history mainly. And these are jobs that children would have had to do in the past, maybe 150, 200, 300 years ago. Uh, this is number nine, so not too bad. But have a look, so it's 1347. Tanners make leather from animal skins. As the apprentice, you're a tanner's living helper. You have to do all the nasty stuff. So far, it's not good. First, you scrape the animal skin to clean it. Then you have to wash the skin. Tubs of old urine are good for getting off all that dead animal hair. That's right, dunk it in the urine. So you can imagine how much enjoyment students get out of these kind of gruesome books. And they get worse, to be honest, these books. So if you have a student that can follow the content, this is a really interesting kind of material. <clears throat> and finally, Read and Discover. So Read and Discover is a graded reader series. So it's designed more for independent reading at a higher level. As you see, we've got text, we've got vocabulary, we've got photographs. So again, this gives access to a range of students. Maybe weaker readers might just focus on the vocabulary. So there are also activities at the back, so not mixed in with the text. So you can choose to use it just as a reader, which is normally what we do, or you can use the activities in class. And this is level two. Again, it moves up a little bit. Level one is 300 headwords. Level two is 450, and so on. It's quite a nice series with the jumps aren't too big. So those were some materials, non-fiction materials. Um, I'd like to talk about how to use them in class. And just because I've been talking for too long already, um, these are the seven activities, I think, that I mainly use in class. What I'd like you to do, if you have someone next to you you can talk to, or a group, um, really quickly for about a minute, see if you can figure out what these activities are before I tell you. Did so, you draw these? I did, yes, last night, very late. <laughs> I was uh, drawing these Good. at home. Yeah. So one minute, please talk to someone nearby, see if you can get these. Okay, 
Hey, did you get them all? <laughs> so I'll walk you through it now. Please give yourself a score mentally. And if you get seven, you can pat yourself on the head. Um, the first step is really interesting for me because I learned about this last year um, at a conference. Excuse me for a moment. Technical support will do with it. Anyway, so I, <coughs> this technique I learned from a teacher called Yuko Suzuki, who will be presenting at some other Oxford Teaching Workshop events in Yokohama, in Osaka, and in one more. Um, but she's wonderful. If you have a chance to see her talk um, at an Oxford event or elsewhere, please do take advantage of this. And she told me about this technique, and it's really changed my classes. Uh, this first technique is before you look at the language in a book. This is with beginner readers, earlier readers. Go through the book with the pictures. If possible, cover up the English, right? Go through the book, elicit language, try and figure out what's happening. So that when the students look at the English, they've already got an idea of the meaning. And they don't start trying to translate things or figure out you know, Japan, the Japanese version of this. They just go from meaning to the English words. And actually taking the time to do this has made a huge difference to my class. So I really recommend it. Before reading, go through, look at the pictures, figure out the story first. The next step after that is, and these aren't in order, right? You don't have to do them this way. These are different activities you can do. Generally, um, this is the simplest to do, and it goes through to more complex. So the first one, of course, is the teacher reads to the students in a story time kind of way. You might go through the pictures and say, oh, and, and elicit language as you're doing it, but you're reading the story to the students. Another version is to read with the students, either as a read and repeat, or a shadow, or just ask the students and help them if they get stuck. So there's lots of versions of this we can do. You can actually do this with the same book, right, on subsequent weeks. So you can actually get quite a lot of mileage out of one book. The next step for me is asking the students to read together in a group. I find three is a good group. More than three is too big. You know, there's, you get students who aren't doing anything. Uh, but three seems to be a perfect number for a triangle. And the next one would be in a pair. So students read together in a pair. This can be quite useful because you can put stronger students and weaker students together. They can help each other. Or you can put stronger students and stronger students. Lots of flexibility. The next one would be a student reading by themselves aloud. And the final one would be a student reading by themselves silently. Now, I think reading aloud and reading silently, these are both useful activities. But you have to keep in mind that they are targeting different skills. Reading aloud um, helps the students uh, with their phonemic awareness, they can decode the words, it helps their pronunciation, it helps their rhythm, uh, but it is not very good for their reading. Okay. Reading silently allows the students to work on their reading speed, okay. because if you read aloud, you have to slow down. Right? People read much faster than they speak. So I think it's important to have both. Right? Make sure you do both. If students only read aloud, then their, their actual reading for content is going to be held back. And of course, you can do all of these activities with a CD as well. Either replacing the teacher here, or having the students listen with a CD as they read. They can shadow with the CD. This is very, very powerful at lower levels especially. At higher levels, having a CD makes it easier to read. So generally speaking, um, if you have a book and a CD, just the book is your kind of normal reading level. If you use a CD with the book, you can normally read harder material. 
Right? It makes it easier to read if you have the CD and if you have only the CD, it makes it more difficult. So you won't be able to read, to listen to this higher level. So you can play with these three levels using the same material. Book only is zero. Book plus CD is easier. CD only is harder. So you can get a lot of mileage out of these materials. Reading out of class. I'm not going to ask you to brainstorm about this one, but basically I think there's three things you can do, what the students can do out of class. They can read books that the teacher gives them. And this is a very powerful technique. Um, if you know Akio Furukawa from SEG in Tokyo, real pioneer of extensive reading, this is what his system does. So the teachers um, know the students, know the books, and they kind of have an idea of what book would be good for students. So you give the students a specific book to read this. Another version would be students just choose books, almost at random. This is what you do if you haven't got a very developed system. And this is good to start. Right? If you have a few story books, say to the students, okay, take, take one book at home and read it at home. And the third version is if you have a program and the students will be working within a set of guidelines and they'll be choosing books from your program. So students, uh, teachers give the books, students choose the books, but in a fairly unfocused way, and students choose books from the program. And let me, I'm going to talk a little bit about a program now. Uh, literally, that's thing I've got. How long? Ten minutes? Perfect. So, <clears throat> the last thing I want to talk about is extensive reading program design. This is what comes next. So hopefully, now, you agree that reading is really important and you want to start doing reading in your class. And this is how you do it, right? These are activities that are very good to start reading. However, once you've got going, once your students are reading and you're using reading in class, the next step is to create an extensive reading program. Now, the considerations here, uh, these are the five big considerations and I will give you a quick 30 seconds here. What do you think these five obstacles are? I think most of them are fairly clear. I'm worried about this. I don't think many people are going to get this one. Um, so from the top, going clockwise, money. Clearly, you can't have an extensive reading program without books. Books cost money. However, I think this is a relatively inexpensive thing compared to computers, compared to software, compared to more teachers, this is pretty reasonable, I think. And once you buy a book, you can use it for quite a long time. Our books at Dog University, six years, lots of use, they're still okay. <laughs> they haven't started falling apart yet. Second is time. Um, you need to take time. Not a lot of time, but you do need to take a bit of time. Um, I believe for an extensive reading program to be successful, you have to do some reading in class as well. You can't just give it to the student and say, hey, read at home. Right? It works much better if you take five minutes in class, ten minutes in class. Start reading your book here, go home and finish it. The, the success rate triples. Right? Storage. Right? Books take up space. Um, the language school I help with, we just had to rent a mansion above the school to make a library, right? <laughs> because it's overgrown in the classroom. This is teacher knowledge, right? The teacher is uncertain about what to do. You don't have enough knowledge, right? You're not sure how to do 
afterwards. Hopefully I can help a little bit with that. And the last one is you need permission from your boss. If you are the boss, that's not a problem. But yeah, this is a, this is a big desk, right? I'm not sure it works so well. Yeah, your, your boss has to approve of this, right? They have to agree that you can use class time to do extensive reading. They have to give you money to buy books. And they have to give you space to provide. So actually, all of these kind of depend on this, right? Next thing is you have to classify your books. If you just have 600 books in a room, the students don't know what to do. Right? And I think the best way to classify books for children is the Yomiya Sano, developed by Akio Futa. Um, you can find this online quite easily. Just look for YL or Yomiya Sano level. And it's very detailed. So it starts from 0, 0.0, which is a picture book with no words. And it goes up to theoretically 9.9, .9, which I would find difficult. And it's a, it's a great range. However, a friend of mine in Sapporo, who has a school, suggested that actually we don't need to do it like this. We can just do 1, 0 to 99, which makes it much easier to understand. And I wish she'd told me that before I labeled all our books. So that's one variation of the Yomiyasa level that I think works quite well. So instead of 1.1, it's just a level. It makes it a little bit easier for the students. These are the books I talked about today with their Yomiyasa level. So you can see these are 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So the Dolphin Reader starter is roughly at the same level as the Firefly. Right? Um, in fact, are a bit higher, and Read and Discover Readers are the highest levels. Well, this is the highest level. And the Yomiesa level basically makes it easy to compare books across series. Because all the different series, even within Oxford University Press, are at slightly different levels. Right? So you can't say to the students, you're at level X. But you can say, you should probably read 0 0.3 books. And the 0 0.3 books are on that shelf. So go and have a look. Right? This just makes it easy to understand what to do next. <coughs> next thing is setting goals. Um, the basic goal is to say time. I use time as a goal. Please read for 10 minutes. Right? Please read for 20 minutes. This is OK, but it depends on the, it's very hard to check. It depends on the students um, doing it. We can use number of books, and lots of programs do use number of books, but there's a pretty big problem with this. Last week I had a student take three books home. One book had 38 words, one book had 60 words, one book had 508 words. All the books were at the same level. Right? This is the problem with books. It's not a very accurate measurement. So, my favorite measurement is to use words, number of words. And you can find the number of words um, either online or through this wonderful book published by uh, Furukawa Sensei, which is the Ego Tadoku Book Guide. <laughs> and it has a list of most of the books in Japan used for English study, along with. Is that um, from Cosmopia? It's from. Yes, it is. Okay. So. And that's how you find the number of words. The problem is you have to label the books, which I've spent a few months doing this. Year. But this is the key for me, actually. Teacher expectations help students focus and help students push themselves. Let me give you an example. I. I'm a huge fan of extensive reading. I think it's by far the best thing you can possibly do. And I don't do it in Japanese. Why? I know how to do it. I know why I should do it. I think I should do it. I want to do it. I don't do it. Why? No one is asking me to. Right? No one is expecting me to. So if I can't do it without expectations, I really don't think the students can. 
So it's hugely important. I give each student a weekly target, and it's based on the student. Right? It's based on what I think they can do without being stressed. And the final thing about program, the extensive reading program design, is start small. Right? Your program will develop to fit your classroom, to fit your school. So don't make a huge complicated plan. Start with one class, start with 10 books, and start doing it and see how it works and make changes along the way. And look at results. So these are, this is a student um, that started doing extensive reading last November. And she really got into it. She's really enjoying it. Um, this is a uh, extensive reading notebook. You can get this online as well. I think it's about 100 yen each, so pretty reasonable. And the students keep a record of the books they read, the number of words they've read, and a comment. Right? This student um, doing great. And this is each week. So that's one week, one week, the next week, and so on. And all our students have started doing this from junior high school and above. And it's a wonderfully motivating tool. But even if you don't use something like this, you can use a normal notebook, you can use a piece of paper, but just make sure the students are tracking what they're doing so they have a record. They can see their progress. So today, um, I hope you got an idea of the power of reading, why it's so important for English as well as Japanese, and the role of non-fiction books in your reading program. So make sure there's a good balance of material, because some students just don't like stories as much. Um, I hope you had a good chance to think about the Oxford University Press readers, the non-fiction ones. Um, there's very few non-fiction readers um, for children, um, and there's a lot of them available here. I hope you had an idea of how to introduce reading into your class, as well as how to design extensive reading program. So, if you have any questions, briefly, I think we've got a minute or two, um, I'd love to answer them, or please come and talk to me after the presentation. So, any questions, first of all?